Our first speaker is an old friend and colleague, Professor Nick Warrior. Nick is Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Head of the Composite Research Group at the University of Nottingham. <clears throat> He's the Director of the UKRI EPSRC Future Composites Manufacturing Research Hub, and his research is on manufacturing processes and designs and test methodologies for high performance composite co polymer composites. He's a chartered engineer and a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, and has received the Royal Academy of Engineering Silver Medal Award in 2009 for a successful industrial exploitation of composite materials. So I'm going to hang over, hand over to, to Nick now, but I would ask if anyone has questions to please use the Q&A tab on Zoom rather than using the chat. Thank you very much. Over to you now, Nick. Uh, well, thanks for that introduction, Kevin. Uh, uh, brilliant. Yes, I'm Nick Warrior, uh, the director of the uh, EPSRC Future Composites Manufacturing Research Hub. Uh, today, I'd like to just give an overview of the hub and to highlight some of the automation-based projects that we've uh, that we've got going on. So if we just start with a few slides uh, to give those people who are not familiar with the hub a bit of an overview of what we're uh, up to. So our objective, therefore, is what we're trying to do is to develop a national center of excellence uh, in fundamental research for composites manufacturing. And you know, the principal aims are to deliver research advances in cost reduction, production rate increase, whilst improving quality and sustainability. So we're, we're very well funded. The EPSRC has given a, a grant of 10.3 million and the industrial and uh, uh, institutional uh, supporting commitments are around 12 and a half million. So it's a, it's a good network where we've got 15 spokes of uh, academic partners around the UK. Uh, you'll recognize some of the big names there. Uh, and we have uh, four uh, catapult partners and these are essential in, uh, in our aim to, uh, to basically have a pull through of technology, a pathway uh, to industry. So you'll see MCC there is our, is our principal delivery partner. AMRC, we've worked on in some uh, draping projects, WMG, very successful with their short fiber work, and MTC is our metrology partner. So we've also got a very strong industrial uh, partnership. You'll see there are all of the OEMs there in the aerospace, defense, and automotive sector, plus representatives of all elements of the supply chain. And that we've got a very enthusiastic uh, industrial panel, so we're very grateful to them for their support. So here are four objectives then. The, the principal aim there is the research, and we want to develop a step change in composites manufacturing science and technologies. But the key is we want to, with the hub, we want to generate a pipeline of these technologies through the, through the catapult to the industrial supporters. We want to train the next generation of composites manufacturing engineers. And, and what we mean by training here is at PhD, NGD, and postdoctoral level. And we want to build and grow uh, the communities, the national, uh, uh, you know, the UK community. Uh, and, but we also, the international support is very important to us to make sure that the UK's work is, you know, is internationally competitive. So, the international community is a very strong uh, element of our, of our work. So how hard can it be to make a composite component? Uh, the challenges are, can be crystallized into to two points, if you like. We've got to precisely place tens of millions of fibers that are smaller than a human hair. And we've got to embed those uh, fibers in a high quality, uh, high integrity matrix uh, free from voids. And the two industry inspired challenges which define this, if you like, we have to enhance the process robust robustness by an understanding of the underpinning science. And we have to develop new high rate processing technologies for high quality structures. And so that captures the, the goal of the hub, if you like. So the operational core. We're integrated with the Center for Doctoral Training in Composites Manufacture that Ivana Partridge leads uh, with uh, Janice as a deputy director. 
We've got a very strong uh, advisory board providing industrial guidance, and we're linked to the uh, Composite Leadership Forum in the UK. Uh, so we, you know, we have very strong support. Now let's start uh, with a, an overview of the research itself. So we have five research themes, uh, high rate deposition, rapid processing, design for manufacture via validated simulation, multifunctional composites and integrated structures, inspection and in-process evaluation and recycling and reuse. And these were defined principally by Kevin and his team back in 2015, but we, we've refreshed the vision. And in 2019, we looked at all of these again and, and, the, and the composites community decided that these were the five principal research themes and challenges. So the hub portfolio to date is that we have 29 investigator-led projects. Uh, these are six core projects, 19 feasibility studies and four fellowships. So the core projects are a three-year projects about 700K. The feasibility studies are six month projects about 50K. And the fellowships are about 250K, two-year placements. So there were 35 investigators from the 15 different universities that we've seen, 28 PhDs and 39 NGDs in uh, the uh, uh, CDT. Now our aim is to uh, fund 37 projects by 2024. As you can see, they, there are some challenges in managing a, a research portfolio of this sort of size. So the way we chose to, man to project manage this uh, this is a busy slide, but we we introduced a work stream approach. So you'll see the five themes at the top. The second layer of the cake is the work streams. So there are eight work streams below the five research themes. And below that, every single project is identified. Uh, every PhD student knows what their role is in supporting these five research themes. So uh, you, you'll see the level of interaction here. I mean, clearly, a PhD or an NGD might expect, uh, because of the depth of, of their studies, they might expect to be supporting one research theme, but the core projects will be interacting much more greatly than that. So let's look at the actual work streams themselves and look at some of the research that's going on uh, with, within the universities. So the first stream, the first work stream is automated uh, fiber deposition. Uh, and you'll see uh, for each work stream, we've got this sort of circle diagram here on the right hand side uh, of your screen. And so you'll see in dark blue or navy blue, the core projects. So these are the high value long term projects. And at the center of that, you'll see that it, uh, automated fiber placement, there's a core project in, uh, in, in the middle of the diagram. And this cooperates with two other core projects, an RTM project and a layer by layer project. And around the circle, the light blue uh, uh, boxes, they're all the feasibility studies. And the orange boxes, these are all the industrial supporters. So you'll see a very strong level of industrial support for this project. I think this sort of, we'd expect this, it's uh, uh, a key technology. And you'll see on the left, uh, so the, the core project in automated fiber placement is uh, uh, Bristol and Nottingham. You'll see on the extreme left is the uh, Tom Turner's uh, uh, a digital twin of his uh, uh, automated fiber placement uh, equipment. And you'll see in the middle is the well-known CTS or uh, toe steering or toe shearing approach that uh, was developed by Eric uh, and uh, Kevin in, in the Simcom Center uh, back in 2015. So what we're trying to do uh, to talk a little bit more detail about this in the next slides. So Tom Turner's approach. Tom asserts that uh, currently when we try and uh, do automated tape laying, there's, there's a basically break in the feedback between the manufactured component and the design component. And this is principally because, uh, you know, the suppliers supply a high quality machine. Uh, the design is designed using uh, 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 existing CAE and that uh, typically there's, a, uh, there's an add-on. 
to turn a laminate design into trajectories. Now, so Tom's approach is to get rid of that uh, third party CAE add on and to feed directly back from the manufactured component into the CAE software. Now, of course, you can't really do that with the existing uh, uh, infrastructure. So Tom's been developing, uh, and this was what Kevin was working on at the, in, the, in the early years of, of the hub. So they've developed this machine together, uh, which is based at Nottingham, but it's got in parallel uh, a, a digital twin. So every uh, step of the process is, is basically simulated in real time on uh, a very complex bit of software. We're looking forward to, to firing this up uh, in anger later on this year. And uh, you know we'll be able to, to do some, some proper trials on this. But I'm gonna show you now what uh, Bristol have, have been doing. So Bristol's work is, uh, let's just make sure, okay. That, so Bristol's work is uh, in looking at basically using their continuous toe shearing process they can make very effective 2D preforms very quickly. The downside is if you try and make preforms in three dimensions, it takes a long time and the quality suffers. So the vision here is to make them into in 2D and form them into 3D components. And this requires a you know, very robust simulation in 3D forming, uh, as, long as, the, the, as well as the work that's already been completed in the CTS process. So you'll see this work has developed quite effectively so far, and we've uh, got a nice, uh, if you look at the two bottom images on the right, this shows that the, it, either the red represents fiber misalignment. So you'll see that the steer prepreg design has developed uh, or delivered a significant uh, improvement in, in quality. Now, what's really exciting about this process is that this process is also using the hyperdiff recycled material. So the potential is that you can get very high quality uh, uh, materials out of end of life or in process waste uh, scrap recycled fibers. So this, this is uh, you know, very exciting work. And in conjunction with the work at Nottingham and Bristol, there's a, a fellow uh, up at Edinburgh, Edinburgh and uh, they, so the team in Edinburgh are, are working on a, a tape manufacturing line, which uses a powder deposition process uh, with dual heating of the tape. So we can construct any type tape we like. And this gives us the opportunity to develop a much wider range of parametric studies for these two processes at Nottingham and Bristol. So if we move on to work stream two, and what we're trying to do in Workstream 2 is optimize the actual fiber architecture. So this is work at Manchester and Nottingham. And the, the key is to, op, to exploit 3D uh, woven architectures. And Andy uh, Long, who, who, who came up with this, has always said he wants to develop structures that are completely unconstrained by manufacturing uh, techniques. So uh, Prasad Potluri and his team have developed some very innovative uh, manufacturing approaches to this. Uh, you'll see their uh, project, their core project is in the center of the diagram. You'll see the uh, industrial su suppliers, uh, Airbus, BAE Systems, AMRC, GK and Aerospace. And you'll see the other core projects that uh, the optimized project cooperates with. We'll have a look at some more details of the system uh, of the project and the systems on the next few slides. So this builds on uh, the TextGen approach. So TextGen, for those of you who don't know, is a free uh, mesoscale geometry and mesh generator. Uh, it's you you know Google TextGen and you can download it for free. It's a multi-scale uh, modeling approach. And the, the vision is to obtain macro scale properties using meso scale geometries. So what uh, Andy and, uh, and the team have, uh, Mikhail, the team have developed uh, six basic loading cases to model all the possible deformations. And in conjunction, they've developed a flow model. Though obviously the, for liquid molding technologies, uh, permeability is the key metric or the permeability vector is the, is the key metric. 
So, uh, so the modeling framework is, is the next phase and let's have a look at this. So with uh, AMRC, uh, the AMRC have provided us with support and tooling for a, a load case. This is a part of a car floor pan. It's basically uh, the seats support, which is very highly loaded, particularly in crash. And the load cases are bending and torsion. But if you have a typical conventional orthogonal weave, the off-axis properties are poor and you can't, you can't uh, improve on a, a, an optimized NCF laminate. So what uh, the team has done is they've used the framework and you'll see there that there's uh, an optimized preform. So if you look at the displacement in torsion versus displacement in bending graph here, you'll see that the uh, multi-axial preform here is significantly stiffer than a, a non-crimp fabric solution or an aluminium solution. So this has been, uh, you know, over a 10% weight saving, so significant advantage. Another piece of work, uh, or the second exemplar, is, is in a tubular structure. And the Manchester team has uh, developed this braid winding process using a, a, a 3D braider, but with also this radial winding. So you'll remember for a pressure vessel, the hoop stress is significantly bigger than a longitudinal stress. If it's a, if it's a nice continuous structure, it's a factor of two. But this way we can uh, develop multi-axial preform with the optimal uh, fiber orientation. We can develop it quickly uh, and very reliably. And in fact, if you look at the, from a pressure vessel point of view, Point of view, everybody looks at stress intensities, uh, whether that's appropriate for composites, that's another discussion, but there's a nice little uh, pressure vessel demonstrator uh, that has, that has uh, been produced so far. So th this, you know, with the, with the boom in the hydrogen economy, this will be a big, uh, a significant uh, use of carbon fiber in the future, in, in my opinion. So work stream three, uh, builds on the outstanding work that's been ongoing at Imperial College for a number of years. Imperial College uh, have developed a supercapacitor using this uh, carbon aerogel core, which has got a very high uh, surface, uh, uh, but by basically using this sort of foam, you've, you've got a huge surface area and you've got the potential to, to store a lot of charge. The problem at the outset was that this can only be made in laminate form. Uh, so this sort of severely restricts the size of the components and the, uh, the storage capacity. So what the team at Bristol and Imperial have been doing uh, with this project is developing 3D structures from, this, from these 2D laminates. And uh, they developed a very successful uh, masking strategy, which means that they can effectively provide uh, flat areas which uh, operate as capacitors and then the, the more structural areas will be a more conventional composite. So this is, uh, you know, this has been demonstrated in scale up for current collection and uh, multi-cell uh, assemblies and they've actually exceeded already the targets that they set themselves for storage at the beginning of the hub. So Workstream 4 is an online consolidation uh, program. Now consolidation or cure time uh, is a major bot bottleneck uh, for any fibers, fiber deposition technology. And the team at Cranfield and Bristol are working on uh, uh, basically a layer by layer consolidation approach where heating and pressure are developed on some sort of, it doesn't necessarily have to be an axisymmetric component, it can be a more conventional AT, ATL approach. We'll have a look at some more details here. So the, the key is they've, at uh, Cranfield, they've developed this consolidation and cure model, which works on a ply by ply basis. And it, if you look at the, the graph on the right hand side, which is temperature overshoot versus cure time, you'll see the two layer by layer uh, crosses show a significant benefit over conventional processing, which is the dots to the, you know, to the upper right quartile of the, uh, of the graph. So there's an opportunity therefore to uh, 
produce these structures much faster without the exotherm that's associated with very thick components. So in fact, here's some studies that were done as part of the feasibility study and that have been subsequently extended into the core project. So they have a cured laminate with I think 13 plies or uh, 13 interfaces. And what they've looked at is the, uh, basically the fracture toughness or, or the, uh, at each of these plies. And you'll see that's the image on the bottom left. Uh, and they've, they've monitored uh, the fracture toughness of each of the uh, interfaces. And basically they can, sh they can show that as long as you don't fully gel uh, the component, the fracture toughness is, is still very high and, and relatively unaffected. So the properties of the component uh, are maintained, even though the, the processing rate is significantly faster, particularly, as I say, for the thick structures. So this is very promising indeed. Now, if we move to work uh, stream five, where we're looking at uh, liquid molding technologies. Now, out of autoclave liquid molding technologies offer great potential, but the reality is they never really meet the same sort of quality requirements that the autoclave structures uh, can deliver. And, you know, the def defects uh, that we see with, uh, with just one atmosphere of pressure are, are much, typically much greater than what, the, what you can achieve by, uh, by autoclave pressures. So what the team at uh, uh, principally uh, Nottingham have been doing uh, uh, in this is the first, the first key is looking at permeability and Andreas Andruvite was one of the uh, participants in a worldwide round robin uh, benchmarking activity for permeabilities. And you'll see in fact on the right, uh, on the left we can see the numbers uh, of people around the world who joined in on, on the round robin. And on the right, you can see the, the level of scatter, the in-plane permeability variability, looking at you know, all, all experts in their field, but th these are the scatter that, that were seen when people used their different permeability uh, study approach. So what Mikhail uh, uh, has been doing uh, with, well, Michael and Mikhail uh, at Nottingham, it's a synergy between engineering and maths They've been using uh, a technology of a Bayesian inversion to, uh, with, coupled with some so, sort of in-process monitoring. So you'll see that in this video here, the sensors are the blue circles. And the sensors will, uh, by measuring the pressure and the, uh, uh, the presence of resin, the Bayesian uh, inversion algorithm can predict where the defects are. And this gives you a map of detected defects and you can use this to control your resin injection strategy. Uh, uh, so, you know, everything is slightly variable. Uh, all of the preforms can, uh, there's a level of stochastic variability in the preforms. So in this way, there is the potential to automatically correct for any of these sort of uh, variabilities in the preforms. It's a very exciting work. And you know they've used this technology. Uh, look at this. The, the typical defects that we see is is defects due to race tracking. You know where where the preform might not fill fill the mold uh, uh, in particular in the in the areas of radii and so on. So the uh, the algorithm can cope very well with three D three technologies. And uh, okay, and this will show you here that. You know the fl the flow front is much faster in the in the region in the uh, race tracking region, and uh, you, you'll see also the as the video scrolls through, you'll see it picks up a red uh, a defect uh, uh, or potential defect that could be corrected for uh, during the resin in, uh, injection. Okay, if we move now on to uh, work stream six where we're considering the composites forming. Now composites forming is, is hugely important. And what we're talking about here is taking 2D textiles and making them into 3D components, uh, multiply. Uh, so 
forming is is really important you know in metals it's significant it's the way that you know most things are made uh and but it's much more difficult in composites than in metals because of the anisotropy and the uh the difficulties with uh the weave structures so what we have here is a number of projects uh, you'll see there's a a core project, uh, non-crimp forming, pre-forming. Uh, it's Cambridge and Nottingham. It links obviously directly to the RTM uh, project uh, because we, you know, we're de developing dry preforms here. And uh, there's a number of feasibility studies that that has supported this. So what the team uh, is trying to do there, there, there are two good examples here that I'll show you. So this is some of the work uh, that is ongoing at Nottingham led by uh, Lee Harper. And what Lee's aiming to do is to do a global to local study. Because these are all explicit finite element based approaches, it's very difficult if you have a large structure with small features because you know you, your runtime is dominated by the smallest element. So for a structure like this, where you have a defect uh, in one particular local area, it, it's a significant advantage if you can do a core study and map the boundary conditions from the core study onto a much finer mesh. Now this is, this is done uh, in implicit FE uh, routinely, but is, is, there are some other challenges in explicit. And what the team, uh, Lee and his uh, researchers have developed to here is, quite a robust uh, process. And you can see that the simulation here gives a fairly uh, high level of agreement with uh, the laser scan uh, image on the, on the bottom. So that uh, the light blue image there, the experimental full scale image is the same thing that's been uh, white light scanned. So this is uh, quite exciting. And what, what the objective of this work is to use an experimental approach to, to try and uh, modify the local uh, ply formability of the, of the preform, either by uh, using a, a gel on the surface or by using uh, a liquid molding approach, but local. So, uh, so basically uh, reducing the friction by, uh, you know, by introducing resin and, and that, that's been quite effective in removing some wrinkles. And then also by removing stitches from the non-crimp fabric. So you'll see on the right there that we have uh, a number of patterns of uh, stitch removal that can actually uh, change the uh, appearance of wrinkle defects in the component. So if we move on to uh, work stream seven, where we're talking about microwave heating technologies. Now, this is not, not been uh, represented greatly in the hub. It, microwave it, it offers huge potential and has done for a long time. We've, we've had four feasibility studies in the hub. And, uh, you know, we can kind of see something there, uh, but it, it, it hasn't really crystallized to anything uh, significant yet. There are two uh, projects that are outlined here and one of those on the left is sort of showing a, a modeling approach. The vision here is to deliver up to 100 kilograms of, uh, of tape and heat it online. So you know the potential of microwave heating means that there is a chance to re reduce energy but also to increase the heating rate for these very high deposition rates. So what what this is Richard Day's work, and he's he done some modeling to, uh, uh, well, he, he basically demonstrates that that is possible. The image in the middle is, uh, is a slightly, uh, uh, inter well, it's very interesting work. It's a novel piece of work. And what it's using is, is local antennae within the tool to get a very uniform heating rate throughout the tool. Now, this, some improvements were noted here, but it, it, it wasn't, didn't really have the traction that we needed for, for this piece of work. So, but this is ongoing and, and you know, it's still a, a great interest to the hub. And on to the final uh, work stream is thermoplastic technologies. Now, thermoplastics, 
you know, that can be very rapidly processed and offer the, uh, the ability to be welded. And, and, you know, this obviously means it's very exciting, but also they can be recycled much more effectively than uh, thermo thermosets. I think it's probably fair to say that this is an area where the UK lags behind some of our European friends uh, who've developed this technology um, with a much greater level of funding, I think, than, than the UK has. So this is this activity will will increase for the re remainder of the hub. So there's a, a project that's ongoing between Bristol and Nottingham, using platform fellowship uh, funding to try and demonstrate thermoplastic uh, technologies. You'll see here some results in these images from two of the feasibility studies. So the image at the top uh, represents Ulster's work on through thickness uh, thermoplastic reinforcement, but you can see uh, where, where fibers are literally injected through the thickness to increase the toughness. And the image below is, is uh, basically looking at tubular braids, uh, tubular thermoplastic braids, so commingled uh, fibers, and then uh, and forming them into uh, 3D structures. This is some work that Chuai uh, uh, Chen has done at Nottingham. And so there's a, a, you know, look, watch this space because our techno uh, technologies and thermoplastics is going to increase significantly in, uh, in, you know, in the, in the, between uh, when the hub ends in 24. So this is the final uh, slide that I wanted to show today. And what we have here is a timeline. So you'll see in the bottom left hand corner, this was the SimComp Center. So SimComp was 2014 to 2016, where we developed these technologies. And these techno so every on this chart, every single uh, project is listed. And this sort of shows uh, a level of how the technology with each of these projects has been continued uh, through to the hub. And also the delivery to the technical pull through uh, program at the National Composite Center. So what we're trying to do effectively is demonstrate an increase in technology readiness level. So that brings my presentation to a close. Thank you very much. I think we have 10 minutes now for questions. Um, what John said is that the, the saturated permeability round robin is technically correct in the context of the Darcy equation, but does not recognize the chemical and physical effects such as wetting at the flow front. Surely the industry needs the data for unsaturated flow permeability for quantitative modeling of LCM processes. Yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, the great, that's a good point, John. I, I absolutely agree with you, you know? So in, in a sense that uh, the work is incomplete. Uh, that's good to know, we've all got more work to do, but yes, I, I mean, I agree with, with John on that. Okay. Is there a standard for that? I mean, that's the, 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 I mean, the, the work for, you know, the, the standards for saturated permeability are pretty well, pretty well known. Is, is there equivalent work going on in the, in the, um, the hub on trying to develop standards for unsaturated permeability? So there are no, the, no, there are no, there isn't any work developing standards in, in the hub. Uh, you know, that, I mean, it's there is obviously work in in the liquid molding uh, area, but you know, as, as far as I know, the standards aren't uh, uh, you know being addressed in that. Okay. Okay. So we'll leave that one. We'll leave that one there. We'll move on to another couple of questions that have come in. A question here from Brett Kimball on how are fibers loaded radially into the braided tube? Right. Okay. That sounds like one of uh, the sides, uh. Yeah, the, the radial is Brett. Are you talking about the radial winding, or uh, you, you know, that's the sort of video I showed where there's a second stage effectively. So the so braided tube comes out, and then they're overwound, and that's how they, uh, you know, it's. It, I mean, in fact, as, as I understand it, Prasad's patented this, so you should be able to find it all very clearly. Uh, outlined in the patent. Okay, so we have an, a, another question to come in. Does, can you please elaborate on the state of the art and TRL 
of thermoplastic composite processing via AFP and ATL in Europe and elsewhere? Well, I mean, for me, the for me, the leader in this is is Remco Remco Ackerman, and uh, I'd refer you to to the TPRC we website where you can, you know, I, I think that is the state of the art. So that's a one stop uh, visit, really. Uh, Remco published a paper actually early this year. For any of you interested in uh, thermoplastic processing, you know, it, it, it's very all of the challenges captured. Uh, all of the challenges are captured in that paper, so it, it's well worth uh, looking that up. I, I, I could share a link actually, if uh, you know, if I could find that tonight and share that tomorrow. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. We have another question on RTM here from an Isa Amami. So, thank you for your presentation. Is there any research going on at Pure Hub for mobile sensors for race tracking in active RTM? Well, thanks for that, Isa. I, so I'm, so we're not actually researching in the sensors themselves. So what it, what we're trying to do is make sure that all of the research we're doing is just on. The, you, you know, we although we've got a lot of money, you know, there's never enough money. So we're not developing sensors. We're actually uh, just looking at you know, just looking at exploit exploiting commercial sensors in that active rtm work so yeah i'm we're not we're not working in that area okay so another couple of um questions starting to come in now so it says from a sayata goes uh, thanks for the talk how applicable is the work stream one if you did not do continuous toe steering is it interested for commercial afp well, hi, Sayata. Yeah, great to see that you're online. So the the Workstream one, so the work at that the Bristol team is doing exploits their CTS, and they're their experts in CTS. The work at Nottingham doesn't use CTS; is a more straightforward uh, AFP approach. So uh, you, you know, the, the, we've tried to get the experts in in CTS to do that to do that work and we're not we're not actually doing that so the ADFP machine that's at Nottingham is is more conventional it doesn't use that uh, the toe shearing effect in CTS okay um there's a question come in are there are there is there any research study in your team with radiation technology to polymerize the composite materials no, we we haven't got any activity in that area at the moment. If there's if you've got some really good ideas, we'd be very keen uh, to hear them. And you know, there's a feasibility study called coming up in May, so there's an opportunity for fifty thousand pounds for a six month study. So if you've got any great, crazy, high risk ideas, we're very interested in hearing them. I, am I right in thinking that would have that's a U, for UK based groups? Only? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, you, you, UK academic based yeah. Uh, only. Yeah, okay, we have another interesting question come in on um, thermoplastics. So, is it, what is the reason for the lag in developing conflicts in the UK? Uh, which thermoplastic processes can be developed in the hub? Uh, well, uh, okay, I think let, let's. Let's be frank. I think the lag is pretty much in thermoplastics, not not so much in thermosets. So I, I I guess that I guess that's probably what you mean. And I, I mean I guess I think there isn't there hasn't really been the industrial demand for thermoplastics. Uh, you, you know they although they have benefits they they also have uh, downside and and for me the biggest downside is the creep. Uh, so if you've got something for, uh, you know, which has a primary structural requirement, uh, then the creep needs to be addressed. I think that's, I think that's a fair comment. And I think Remco would probably agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Just a general uh, thing. So I have another question here. It says, what is the state of research around AFP in the automotive sector for smaller complex geometries away from aerospace? Well, that's a really, it's a really good, good question. So the state, I don't know of a single part made using AFP for the automotive sector. I, I, uh, 
One of our partners is uh, the Gordon Murray uh, design team. And if, you've, if you're interested in supercars like me, you'll look, theirs is the, probably the state of the art at the moment. And, and you know, that's made with textiles, prepreg textiles. And so I'm not sure that there is a significant AFP in the automotive sector. If there is, I'd be really happy I, um, to be corrected. I, I probably need to point out at this point that the, one of the companies that I talked about earlier has just taken a contract to develop just that. Brilliant. FP yeah. for automotive. So it, it, it nascent would be, I think, the best way of putting it, rather than something that is currently in the works. Uh, we had another question earlier about the presentation materials, and yes, they will all be made. They will all be made openly available. I have a, a, a one more question, I think, to get towards the end here now. So if you, you know, we have here a huge range of work that's going on across a very wide field of composites manufacture, but even so, you must be aware of gaps in the current work program. If, if you had, you know, if you had, were given another five million by the kindly government, uh, where would you, where would you, where would you put uh, the, the money down now? Okay, that's a really good point, Kevin. What what I what I like is compression molding, and I think compression molding is is a a good way to get very high rate manufacturing. But there are some real challenges, aren't there? So, if you look at, for example, the over molding that the NCC has just committed to, for me that that's that's future. You know, I think there's there are there are huge challenges with the interface between the uh, you, the, the discontinuous fiber phase and the continuous fiber phase but i think once that's once that's addressed that's going to be really good you know that's going to be a, that's going to make a huge impact right just a couple of last questions that just come in for one from yeah. bitres so that outside of reprocessable thermoplastics how is the hub looking to address the need for automated composites to become more sustainable well, that's, that's a brilliant topical question because you'll see that one of our research themes was recycling and reuse, but we haven't really had a lot of, uh, we haven't had a lot of bids uh, in the feasibility study calls for sustainability-based projects. What we're trying to do in our, in our May feasibility study call is to actually address this by uh, aligning that call more with sustainable projects. So, so well done, Bitres. I mean, you, you're dead right. Uh, the huge levels em of embodied energy in composites mean that we can't just uh, landfill them at the end of the life, or, or we can't throw away the scrap. We've got to, we've got to use it to make a, a structural component. Okay. And another question is literally just coming up. So it's, uh, it's very interesting, and that is, is how it's coming from Gary Scott and asked, how is the hub? interacting with SMEs that have specific problems to address? Yeah, I mean, there are SMEs. You saw uh, on the industrial sponsors that there are 25 industrial sponsors and 14 additional people. And these additional industrial people are people who have come along uh, and worked with us. But if, if, Gary, you've got a particular manufacturing problem that needs addressing now, the hub probably isn't the best approach. Uh, but if you pro, you know, if you come come to us, we can sort of talk to you. We've got business development managers, and they can possibly get Innovate UK funding to address your particular, you know, challenge. If it's something that's aligned with one of our activities, yeah, we're more than happy to help. If it's something slightly different, you know, there's probably a different funding route that's best for that, and we can help with that too. Okay, we have run out of questions, and I think that's probably an excellent point to say thank you very much for an extremely uh, good presentation covering a huge amount of uh, a very interesting work. So, oh, yeah, thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks.